Sukanya, so let me know when can we start. We can start now. Atin, can you hear me? So is it is it fine? Yeah. I think uh, you should start now. You're on mute, Atin. Uh, very good afternoon, good evening, good morning, uh, from wherever you are. I am Atin from CSE. I am joined by my colleagues, Hart, Trihuvan, and Minakshi, to welcome all of you in today's webinar to discuss the global plastic treaty. Uh, just to give a quick background and context, the United Nations Environment Assembly adopted Resolution 5 slash 14 in March 2022. And as an offshoot of the uh, as, an, as an offshoot, the Intergovernmental Negotiating Committee or INC was formed with all even member states. After three rounds of INC, we had the zero draft of the treaty, which was floored in INC 3 in Nairobi, Kenya in November last year. Like every other multilateral negotiation around climate, uh, the geopolitics that we have observed so far has raised many critical questions to the possibility of an ambitious global plastic treaty merging as an outcome. The positions taken by countries with high fossil fuel reserve or strong ecosystem of petrochemical industries across the world is again a traditional debate between environment and economy. Now, unless the Global Plastic Treaty is addressing the full life cycle of plastics, which is mandated to stringent measures and not having a myopic view towards plastic as a litter or waste problem, it would be difficult to deal with the plastics going forward considering the current scale of production and consumption. But we are going to contemplate all these questions today. Uh, the report that we are going to release shortly is an infographic analysis of 118 nations across the world whose interventions have been very, very critical to shape the draft treaty that we have right now. The report has been authored uh, by my senior colleague Siddharth, who has been wonderfully supported by my colleagues Ibuvan and Minakshi. Arriving at the report required reading several thousand interventions by the member states. It was extremely difficult, and I'm so thankful to the team for making it possible. We have a pool of amazing panelists to share their insights with all of us, and I shall introduce them all uh, while I invite them to speak. Uh, we have received about 600 registrations from many countries. And I thank each one of you for your interest. Uh, just for housekeeping, this webinar is divided into three sections. In the first section, Siddharth will make a short presentation on the key findings of the report. We will then divide, uh, invite the panelists to share their observations. In the last section, we shall take as many questions as possible from all of you. I request all of you to post your questions in the Q&A box during the discussion. Uh, now it's time to release the report titled Global Plastic Treaty Negotiation, Country Positions. We managed to get printed copies just about a couple of hours back, so we didn't have the opportunity to share the copies with the panelists. Uh, Siddhartha and Tribhuvan, if I may request both of you to hold the report in front of the camera so that the participants can see it. Uh, we are posting the download link in the, uh, of the report in the chat box right now so that we all can see it and comment on it. Let me just post the report as well. So this is the report. Uh, we are putting the link. Uh, download link in the chat box. Um, so without wasting any further time, uh, let me now invite my colleague Siddharth to make this presentation. Uh, Siddharth, you have about 15 minutes. Uh, you have Thank 
you. Thank you, Atin. Um, I hope my screen is visible. Um, so, okay. Um, so today I'll be uh, talking about two uh, pieces that we've done. One is the report that we've just released, uh, which basically uh, talks about the global scenario, uh, the ongoing negotiations to end plastic pollution, uh, and which country has taken uh, what kind of position in the in the negotiation process. And I will also throw in some references, some references from India on the basis of a story that we have uh, very recently released. It, it has been published in the down to earth print edition that uh, uh, went on the stands on the 16th of this month. So, uh, I mean, start off with, this is very important to understand where do plastics come from, uh, right? So essentially plastics are petrochemical product, all of which, almost all, I mean, 99% of all the plastics are derived from crude oil uh, and natural gas, which which basically are uh, uh, give us long hydrocarbon chains, which are broken down into smaller molecules in, in a cracking unit, uh, which give us monomers like ethylene, propylene, uh, benzene, xylene, et cetera, et cetera. And these monomers then undergo polymerization in the, uh, in the presence of additives and processing aids, which are nothing but chemicals to give us products made out of plastic that we use in our daily life. So as you can see, everything from carry bag, to tires, to kitchenware, packaging material, clothing is derived from crude oil and natural gas, which essentially is the link between uh, between um, and the oil and gas industry, the pet petrochemical industry and the plastic industry itself. So while uh, I, I just want you to kind of keep this flowchart in mind because uh, as we move ahead, I'll also draw some references from, from this flowchart. Now, who are the key players in this entire uh, negotiation process and also in the, in the uh, plastic and petrochemical space itself? So as you can see, uh, uh, the oil and gas production is uh, dominated by a handful of countries like the United States of America, Saudi Arabia, uh, and so is the case with the global plastic production. Uh, about 32% of uh, the global plastic production is happening in China. So uh, what we can kind of conclude from this slide is that uh, both the oil and gas industry and the plastic industry uh, um, are actually oligopolic in nature, which means they are controlled by a few major players. They can be countries and even within the countries, uh, there are some private or public players which control the entire market for both oil and gas as well as plastics. Now, more often than not, we've heard that uh, plastics are a waste management problem, a litter problem, and, and they do not really have anything else to do with uh, the upstream pollution part of it. But uh, these are some of the issues that we've been able to identify. This is not an exhaustive list, uh, but these are some issues which prove that plastic is much more than a litter problem. It is much more than just a waste management problem. The first issue is the unsustainable production levels. So the last 20 years, our, our plastic production has gone from about 230 million tons to now 460 million tons, which means in the last 20 years, the plastic production has doubled. And it is going to triple again in the next 20, 25 years is, is what the projection is right now. Uh, in terms of emissions, uh, the visible emission, and what we see littered on streets or, or accumulated in our water bodies is something that we tend to talk about. But if you actually look at the entire life cycle of plastics, from, uh, from the extraction of raw material uh, to, uh, to refining those raw materials and making products, monomers, polymers, and then eventually uh, your uh, plastic products out of it, every unit operation, every stage contributes to, uh, to uh, some kind of pollution. It can be air pollution, it can be water, groundwater pollution, uh, and definitely there is, there is the solid waste uh, pollution as well. So if, if we decide, divide the entire life cycle of plastic, this is very important because 
as we move ahead, we'll be giving references to the upstream, midstream, and the downstream of the plastic life cycle. So the upstream is where the extraction happens and uh, and the refining happens uh, to make monomers and polymers. And the midstream is where these polymers are converted into plastic products. And the downstream is when these plastic products are discarded by users like you and me. And we then look for avenues through waste management technologies to deal with this kind of waste. So upstream is extraction, refining. Midstream is making products made out of plastic from the polymer that was uh, that we obtained. And the downstream is essentially waste management. So plastic pollutes at every stage of its life cycle from extraction to disposal is what we are trying to say here. And that's why it's much more than a litter problem. And the last nail in the coffin is uh, the chemicals that are used in plastics and the impact that they have on human health. So if you remember the flow chart, just try and recall the flow chart. We, we saw a few molecules like benzene, toluene, xylene, all of this in themselves are hazardous chemicals. Uh, I mean, there are uh, evidences, scientific evidences, where uh, 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 scientific papers have reported that, uh, um, for instance, vinyl chloride, the monomer uh, from which polyvinyl chloride is um, uh, is derived, uh, is is a reason for uh, angiosarcoma. Uh, benzene, styrene um, are proven to be human carcinogen, and they're also neurotoxic. Uh, on the other hand, if, if we actually look at uh, uh, some of the additives that go into manufacturing plastics, which, uh, which, which we try to list down, some of the most commonly used additives like flame retardants, like plasticizers or stabilizers, uh, they have uh, uh, a clear impact on human health, um, uh, which, can, uh, which can affect reproductive systems, uh, uh, which can affect uh, uh, endocrine systems uh, and and also uh, can can hinder the uh, neurodevelopmental uh, uh, neurodevelopment in in human beings. So this slide basically uh, what what my my uh, takeaway would be is that we it is now time that we start to think about uh, plastics as not just a waste management and litter problem, but it is much more. It is an unsustainable production problem, it is contributing to climate change, it, it pollutes at every stage of its life cycle, and there are a lot of chemicals, most of which are not disclosed uh, by uh, by uh, the the uh, producers uh, of, of plastics and petrochemicals. Now, keeping all of this in mind, uh, there was a groundbreaking resolution which Athin spoke about at, at the United Nations Environment Assembly, which is a body um, that uh, discusses uh, the most pressing environmental challenges across the globe. Uh, it is mandated to meet every two years. Uh, so the last time it met in, in uh, 2022, uh, in March, it adopted a resolution which was called the uh, Resolution 5-14. Now, this resolution basically talks about countries coming together and starting a negotiation process very similar to the climate agreement, uh, wherein all the countries will come together and they will try to develop a global set of regulations which can help us to end plastic pollution. And it explicitly mentions that while these negotiations are going on, we have to look at the entire life cycle of plastic. Now, who will be making the decisions in, in, on this, in this negotiation floor? Is, uh, uh, is the Intergovernmental Negotiating Committee. Now, the INC is nothing but a uh, uh, an agglomeration of all the governments uh, which which people like you and me have elected into power and they will be representing you and me and and talking about uh, talking about how our roadmap should look like if we as a world have to tackle the uh, crisis of plastic pollution so uh, there have been a lot of development so uh, so far uh, there have been three meetings that have concluded the fourth one is starting uh, from the 23rd of this month. Uh, during the last meeting, the zero draft uh, that was developed by the Secretariat was the basis of the negotiations. Uh, and as you can see, the zero draft, I've just given a small snapshot, but the zero draft is actually divided into six different parts. And part two is where the substantive elements lie. So uh, the most important obligations 
whether we will have reduction targets, whether we should talk about chemicals, whether we should talk about single-use plastic, all of that are focused in part two, which is what we've considered uh, for the analysis of the report that we have released today. Now, on the basis of the zero draft that was negotiated, member states uh, from the Intergovernmental Negotiating Committee made interventions and they also made written submissions, which is uh, available in the public domain on, on the INC website. And on the basis of the inputs received by these member states, we now have a revised zero draft. Now, this revised zero draft will become the basis of negotiations in the meeting that is starting from the 23rd of uh, this month. Now, let us look at how every country is, uh, is, is positioned on, on various obligations that had been uh, laid out by, uh, by the zero draft. So, uh, uh, on in the upstream part, if you actually look at it, uh, the first obligation is uh, primary plastic polymers, which talks about whether we should have a target uh, of of reducing how much plastics we are uh, we are uh, generating year after year. And uh, the if you if you go back and look at the publication, it is it is self explanatory. But what I will do is I will just run you through. Uh, a few of the maps and and uh, help you to understand how how some of the countries have positioned themselves so in in terms of whether we should talk about reducing uh, the production of primary polymers or virgin plastics uh, only the pacific small island develop, uh, developing states and norway have agreed to reduction targets the european union has agreed but with some riders they have given some uh, condition. Uh, and then there are countries like Russia, China, India, who have disagreed to this uh, obligation. And they've said that we do not want this obligation to feature in the final text that will be developed. Uh, the second obligation is talking about what kind of chemicals go into making polymers or, or, um, um, or, uh, or what kind of polymers can be harmful to the environment and human health. Uh, so on this, uh, actually, um, uh, countries like India and Iran, uh, they have they have deleted the language on polymers of concern, but they've agreed to talk about chemicals of concern. Although it is not very clear whether they really are interested to you know seriously talk about this issue, uh, but they have uh, still kept that under discussions. Uh, and then there are countries like China and the United States of America, which have deleted the language on groups of chemicals. Now, this is very important because uh, when we talk about a certain chemical and when we talk about groups of chemicals, you know, the entire scenario changes because, uh, for instance, if we if the negotiating committee decides that, okay, we are going to ban a certain chemical, um, that chemical can, the recipe for that chemical can be changed, you know, over a period of uh, days. Right, you just change a functional group; it will have pretty much the same uh, functionality. Uh, but because the functional group is at a different position, or the functional group itself is different, uh, it is out of the ambit of the substance that is banned. But on the other hand, if we actually target groups of chemicals, which is something that China and US disagree to, we can actually look at a larger chunk of chemicals that can be uh, uh, can be addressed at a single time. Uh, now, about the third obligation where we talk about uh, problematic and avoidable plastics or unnecessary plastics or non-recyclable plastic, this includes single-use plastic. Uh, Japan is actually the flag bearer for this, uh, uh, for this obligation because uh, Japan's original submission was that this treaty uh, should only focus on single-use plastics. So Japan is uh, actually very supportive of this uh, uh, obligation. Uh, and then there are countries like India, Iran, uh, and China who have actually deleted strong language in, and also the United States of America. They've deleted strong language like restrict and eliminate, and they have changed that to um, uh, with uh, language like regulate, which is which is a weaker language. Now, and then there are uh, uh, regions like uh, um, uh, Pacific Small Island Developing States and EU who have actually. Um, uh, upheld this this obligation and they are saying that we, we should talk about restricting uh, and and also uh, uh, not allowing the use uh, and production of 
uh, problematic and avoidable uh, plastic. And now we come to the midstream part where where you know plastic products are 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 made. Um, here actually uh, countries like USA and India um, are are heavily focusing on how can we increase recyclability of a certain plastic product. Uh, but for this, uh, the methodology or 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 the way ahead uh, that is suggested by both US and India is is to have national uh, legislation around this and also uh, uh, some voluntary some kind of voluntary initiatives within the country and not anything that that has to be considered globally uh, on the other hand we have countries like iran who have absolutely disagreed to uh, uh, reduce the use of virgin uh, polymers for making any kind of plastic products as we move ahead from here uh, use of recycled content so this is again the more recycled content you use, the lesser virgin material you have to use. That is the whole idea. And that is how uh, secondary plastics or recycled plastics are being uh, uh, are being pushed into this agenda and, and play a very important role in actually achieving circularity that a lot of countries keep talking about. Uh, now, here in the recycled plastic content, USA and European Union have agreed to most of the provisions. Uh, India and China have uh, have partially agreed, but they've also at the same time said that this can only be used for appropriate plastics, not for every kind of plastic uh, or every kind of application. Um, China uh, has also warned that uh, if we are moving, uh, going down this road, it has to be done with uh, a very cautious approach. And then there are uh, regions like Africa who have actually said that uh, uh, we should come up with certain applications for which the use of recycled plastic content has to be mandated. So these are the different uh, positions that the countries have taken. In the downstream uh, around around extended producer responsibility, uh, most of you might be aware of what extended producer responsibility is. It basically works on the principle of polluter pays, uh, and it places back the accountability on the on the people or the entities who are putting out plastic products on any market, any global market. So um, on EPR, uh, right now there is no agreement on a global harmonized EPR. There are varying views from, from different uh, delegations. Uh, there are some um, uh, inputs where uh, uh, some suggestions have come in to do sector-based EPR. So an EPR that should just focus, let's say, on packaging plastics or an EPR just, that should just focus on textiles. Um, and some also propose, some countries like Russia, Iran, USA have proposed a non-fiscal EPR, which is uh, which is actually defeating the entire principle on which extended producer responsibility is based. Um, if if uh, if there is no uh, uh, deterrent that is created for uh, for the polluters who are putting out the product. Uh, through fiscal mechanisms, uh, it's very difficult to get this accounted and and also uh, implemented. Uh, on the waste management part, uh, in fact, this is how we started our discussion that a lot of countries are saying that plastics is a waste management problem and we have to deal with this problem just by focusing on the waste management part. Now, what we've observed here is there are a few countries, a handful of countries like Iran, India, Japan, Russia, uh, they do not, they want the treaty to just focus on waste management, but they do not want to uh, conduct waste management operations following the waste hierarchy. Now, the waste hierarchy is, uh, is, uh, is kind of an idea where reduce is given the highest uh, preference and disposal or recovery, energy recovery is given the least preference. But uh, all these countries, Iran, India, Japan, Russia, have deleted the language on waste hierarchy, which means they will not follow the waste hierarchy while they are doing waste management of, of plastic waste. Uh, while on the other hand, there are countries like US and EU uh, who have agreed to take waste hierarchy into consideration while they, uh, while they talk about this obligation in the, um, in the treaty negotiation process. Now, there are some cross-cutting issues. So, for instance, Just Transition, we have experts on Just Transition with us today on the call. Uh, so, I'll not talk much about this. Uh, I'll, I'll leave it for them. But uh, Just Transition basically means, or, or the whole idea in a nutshell, is 
to ensure that people who are involved across the value chain of of plastics including waste workers uh, should not uh, should not lose livelihoods or should be compensated from the transition that is going to happen from this point of time so uh, here we've seen that uh, africa and usa have actually agreed to most of the provisions uh, brazil and uh, eu have actually strengthened by suggesting that we need to uh, have safer working conditions for people um, who are who are working in this space uh, uh, and then there are countries like iran who have simply disagreed to uh, any kind of language or or obligation on this transition uh the last part is uh, that we'll be talking today is is the financing bit now this it may be too early to talk about financing in in an in a negotiation process where we still do not do not have a lot of agreement in, in fact lots of disagreement on the substantive parts uh but what we what we observed so far is that uh, uh the zero draft uh, actually was inclined towards uh the small island developing states and the least developed countries to be financed to this uh to this treaty uh but we are we are seeing a lot of developing countries demanding that there has to be a dedicated fund for for doing all the activities that are that are uh, kind of listed in in the treaty um and then there are developed countries like us eu who are saying that uh, uh existing funds have to be mobilized and private public domestic international every fund have to be kind of mobilized to uh, uh meet the financing requirements uh, for this treaty in fact iran has made a very uh, if you if you look at iran which is uh, which is right here they have in fact said that developed countries should be mandated to finance all the countries whose economy is highly dependent on income that is generated from fossil fuels so this is the kind of uh, submissions that that has come in from uh, some of the uh, some of the um, oil producing giants that that we have Uh, across the globe now what do we expect from inc4 so uh, we we know that the negotiations that are going to happen in the upcoming meeting are on the basis of the revised zero draft uh, there was a lot of uh, hue and cry about intersessional work uh, there was uh, there was intersessional work that was supposed to start in the last session but uh, countries could not agree on what do we need to talk about during the intersessional work so no intersessional work happened between the third and the fourth meeting but there is high likelihood that we will have a mandate for intersectional work between the fourth and the fifth meeting now there's a decision uh, there's a there's a pause in the rules of procedure which which basically is uh, kind of stuck which which is on how decisions will be arrived at if there's a deadlock situation in the negotiation room how do we arrive at a uh, as a at a decision uh, this probably will not be touched in this meeting right so the the debate is between whether decisions have to be made uh, through consensus or uh, if there's a deadlock situation uh, member states can actually go for voting now this is something that uh, uh, that uh, kind of uh, ate up about 3 days in the second inc meeting and that's why the secretariat is now very uh, uh, very concerned whether whether they should bring it up in in any of the further meetings but definitely it is something that has to come up uh, because this will tell us how the decisions will be made as we move ahead and then uh, in the revised zero draft we've seen some uh, aspects like health aspects nanoplastics and circularity uh, that have been added in in the uh, in the revised zero draft which were not there in the zero draft so uh, we yet need to see how member states will now react to uh, these issues so that's it from from my side uh, I'll, i'll stop sharing my screen and hand it over to atin thank you atin Yeah, yeah thank you siddharth uh, for the wonderful presentation which basically gives us a bird's eye view of um, what has happened so far and what can we expect from inc4 uh, now it's time to uh, invite our first panelist panelist uh, dr uh, swaminathan sivaram um, i mean he is someone who does not really uh, need an introduction but i'm just going by the format of the event and i'm privileged to to introduce him i just put his uh, short bio on the screen so that all of us can see it um so sorry uh, so dr S dr swaminathan is a celebrated polymer scientist and currently working as the senior scientist and honorary professor at the indian institute of science education and research uh, known as icer in pune india 
prior to this, he served as, as the eighth director of the National Chemical Laboratory or NCL between 2002 and 2010, and as CSIR Bhatnagar Fellow between 2010 and 15, and JC Bose Fellow between 26 and 15 at the NCL. Uh, Dr. Simbaram did his graduation from Madras Christian College in 1965, long, long back, and master's in uh, 1967 from IIT Kanpur. He completed his PhD from Purdue University, uh, Indiana, United States in 1971, and has worked with many celebrated scientists, including the Nobel laureate Professor H.C. Brown. He's a highly decorated scientist with numerous awards to his credits. He's a recipient of the Vishwakarma Medal uh, from the Indian National Science Academy, Silver Medal of the Chemical Research Society of India, Millennium Medal of the Indian Science Congress Association, Distinguished Alumnus Award of IIT Kanpur, and there are many, many more. Uh, so uh, we are truly honored to have you with us today, uh, Professor Sivaraman. And thank you for joining us in such a short notice. I know you had to reschedule many of your prior commitments for this webinar. Uh, I would now request you to share your observation with the participant and co-panelist about the journey so far towards the Global Plastic Treaty. I would request you to specifically comment on the challenges with the unsustainable production and consumption of plastics and chemicals used in plastics. Uh, you have about 15 minutes, sir. Uh, the floor is now yours. Over to you. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Dr. Biswas. Uh, I do, I'm a, I'm a audible uh, to everyone. I mean, are you able to hear me? Uh, Dr. Sivaram, we are unable to. Yes, sir, we can hear you. No, are you am I audible? Yes, you are. OK, good. Thank you very much. Uh, a very good evening to every one of you out there. Uh, thank you, uh, Siddharth, uh, for reaching out to me and insisting that I be present. I think uh, uh, once that I'm one, you know, since I'm here and listening to you, uh, I think it's an important occasion for me to be present today. Uh, so I, I, I thank you for your kind invitation. Uh, honestly speaking, this is such a complex topic uh, uh, that to provide uh, some kind of a magic wand solution uh, is, is almost impossible. At the same time, I think uh, we all must put together our heads and uh, and, re and and see what is it that we can do uh, in order to make this problem less uh, impactful you know, on our society. Now, just like every other uh, uh, problem that we talk about, uh, you know, uh, and especially in the context of uh, the environment and the planet Earth, uh, this is a very complex transboundary problem. And that's one of the reasons why I believe that uh, the group of nations across the United Nations uh, have joined together to see whether they can find a solution or a, at least some approach to a solution uh, to this problem. Uh, the goals of the, uh, of the uh, intergovernmental panel that has been set up for this plastics pollution is absolutely ambitious. Uh, I can... I can already see from the brief presentation that uh, uh, Siddharth uh, Singh made that there are very contrasting positions taken by multiple countries uh, in order to kind of protect their internal stakeholders. And I, I think that's but natural. I think every such complex problem start with extreme positions, but over a period of time, people move into some kind of a convergence and I do hope that these uh, uh, consultations will really prove to be useful and productive. Uh, I only wish and hope because uh, for those of you who are partners to this uh, deliberations and others who are participating in the deliberations, I only hope that we do not seek a very simple solution to a complex problem because such a solution is, in my opinion, invariably with the wrong solution, okay? And therefore, there is no way we can think of simple solutions. And, uh, and I think if we come up with some very simple solution, I mean, I think that the needle will not move and it will have no consequence, in my opinion, uh, to the solution of the problem. Uh, therefore, I start with certain statements which I believe are simple solutions 
uh, if you can implement, but may not be possible to implement. But I hope that we do not come back with such simple solutions to this problem. And then I will come back and say, what is it that we should be doing? Uh, we should not simply say we should ban plastics. You know, that's not a solution. Okay. Uh, we can't say you stop producing plastics and shut down the entire industry. That's not likely to be a simple solution. Uh, you cannot say, in my opinion, that we should have 100% recycling and a circular economy will solve the problem. It's not a solution, okay? Because that's easy to say, but extremely difficult to implement. It's very easy to say, you, you see today, everybody is talking about it, but the problem is it's not easy to implement on the ground. So let's not simply use these words to hide certain things that we are not, we, we, we will never be able to achieve. So these kinds of terminologies, in opinion, unless they are granularized, unless they are specified to a very granular level, generally saying that all plastic should be recycled is, in my opinion, is a wrong statement. And I hope that it's not happened. I mean, it, there could be examples where plastic should be recycled and there should be examples where plastic should not be recycled. And I think that's that's kind of an issue that we need to look at in a very, very granular manner. And those of you, I'm sure many of you know about plastics, uh, but plastics are not a single species, you know. And I think uh, Siddhartha, uh, Siddhartha Singh did show one slide in the beginning. You know, plastics is a compositions in terms of compositions of chemical compositions. You know, they span a very, very wide range of materials. And therefore, to have a single solution to all plastics is, in my opinion, is not possible. Therefore, you have to kind of get down into granular details in order to understand how do you want to handle, uh, you know, plastics in the environment. Uh, lastly, although the statement was made by Siddharth, I would beg to disagree. We should never make the statement that all plastics and their constituents are hazardous to human health and environment. No, there may be some, but there are many which are not. And therefore, to say, to brand this entire broadly termed material as plastics as hazardous to human health is I think we are doing a disservice to society. And I hope that we again go back and say which of them are matters of concern and which of them maybe are matters of less concern and which of them are actually matters of least concern. And I hope that we put them in these buckets before we talk about hazard because hazard cannot be, I mean, you can't simply say that entire plastics is a hazardous material. No, it is not. And I mean, as a scientist, I can say that I can justify it. Now, of course, there may be categories of plastics which could be hazardous. There are categories of additives which could be hazardous. But I think we need to single them out in order to understand, I mean, where they appear in our life cycle of the material that we are talking about. And therefore, I think we don't come up to these simple statements, in my opinion, because if you, the, if you make the simple statement, the chances are that there'll be no consensus on how to deal with them. Because, I mean, uh, and I think if you, if you get down to more granular details, then maybe we can deal with certain things, you know, in a very preferential way. Because we know that those are the things that we need to handle on priority, rather than saying that everything should be done in the next, you know, 10 years or 15 years of our, uh, on the life of this planet Earth. What we need, in my opinion, and I've been arguing this in both industry forum as well as in academic forum through numerous lectures that I've delivered, which I have, I have talked about, we need a very nuanced way of understanding plastics. And I think uh, in the public imagination, plastics is one material like steel or copper or aluminum. It is not. Unlike copper, aluminum and steel, even, even in copper and steel, I'm sure there are many subcategories. But in the case of plastic, there are thousands of subcategories. And therefore, it is something that a common man doesn't understand. You know, this is, the, this, is, this, is, this is what chemistry has been able to do it for us. And this is not something that common man understands. Okay, the common man just doesn't understand this. So this is where I think, and therefore I believe that we must have a very nuanced approach, which should be science-based approach. Okay. And it should not be based on what I call vague languages that we use. And this, 
I think must be embedded into our thinking process right from day one, if you want to find a solution to the problem. Uh, I think there is a combination of uh, 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 efforts that will be required in order to tackle this uh, problem. Uh, but I think many of them have been often spoken about, talked about, and I see that there are stakeholders here in this meeting itself who are participants in the downstream activities in the plastics life cycle. I will not discuss that, the challenges you know, that we face in that part of the life cycle. There are people I, I see from Swetch and others who can talk maybe more uh, uh, competently about that. But I think what we need is to conserve the carbon in the plastic. And that should be the science-driven approach. And therefore, I'm going to say today that we should have, just like we have talked about restricting emissions, we should also what we call a zero carbon philosophy or a zero carbon target for the plastics industry. And that has to be defined in opinion. It's not, therefore, it's no longer a question of waste. It's no longer a question of toxicity. It's a question of conserving the carbon. And that is, in my opinion, the fundamental principles of sustainability. Now, just like we have a zero carbon dioxide, a net zero target, can we have a net zero carbon plastics target? Okay. That means whatever carbon is embedded in the manufacturing of the plastic is somehow reused in our society. Okay. And that has to be the manner in which we want to look at this problem. When you look at that kind of a problem, lands, landfilling, incineration, recycling, all of them become less important. Okay. They become less important because none of them are going to conserve the carbon. And therefore, you need to look at a science-based target, just like a zero carbon dioxide emission that we're talking about, a net zero emission in terms of CO2. Can we have a net zero carbon plastics, you know, in terms of a target? Today, we know how much carbon is leaking out of the environment. Can we kind of say over a period of next 30, 40 years, how do we reduce the leakage of the carbon in the environment? And how do we keep on conserving and reusing this carbon? And I think that should be the discussion. That should be the targets that nations must set. Because if you set a zero carbon plastics economy in 30, 40 years of time, automatically the rest of the solutions will be kicked in. And I hope that that is the language we need to use. Not saying that we should recycle more, not saying that we should produce less. But what we say is whatever carbon gets embedded into the plastics, okay, it must not be lost in the environment. And that, if you say that, and then we, we can start figuring out what are the good methods of doing it and how do we do it and have a, a phased target by which nations can move towards a net zero carbon plastics in the environment. So this is the a message I am giving at the moment, because if we set this kind of a message, we need to bring in, of course, multiple uh, 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 actions, appropriate public policy. We talked about this. I think there were some comments that were made, initiatives focusing on both incentives and disincentives, just like we are doing today for carbon. Okay. We are doing, we are, the world is at the stage where we are trying to incentivize carbon usage our carbon emissions, less carbon emission, and this incentivize more carbon emission. Now, that kind of a thing has to come in plastics. We have to incentivize more carbon recycling or more carbon recycling and disincentivize less carbon recycling so that the conservation efforts go on. Uh, we need to do this. We need to have, of course, I said zero carbon policy for plastics, in my opinion. Of course, we need consumer education that is uh, downstream. I think uh, we probably need not use plastics in many applications. And this has to be a voluntary means by which the producers, the packaging manufacturers, and the consumers agree that we will not use these plastics. Uh, it's not simply, you can't only go to the consumer and say, don't use it because you have to also stop them from be being produced. And that is something that we can agree upon because we know that there are many cases, every you know, uh, intelligent and good sense citizen will say that we don't need it 
you know, and we can do away with it. And I think that kind of a consensus we have not achieved. Uh, we need a, a very def well-defined social responsibility uh, definition for packaging industry. And I think that is very important because the packaging industry has to fall in line with certain social responsibility. And I hope that that we can uh, talk about. We need to foster what I call trust and free communication. I think that's sorely lacking today. And I hope that I hope that we can bring this communication somehow, and then we can build this, uh, you know, conversation and dialogue because everybody agrees there's a problem. Nobody disagrees there's a problem. I think we are where where people will disagree is how do you solve the problem? Okay, and I think and I think we can we can we can reach there. And lastly, and this I have been advocating from a technology point of view, and I hope that this can be agreed upon by all the countries of the world. We don't have a good labeling system for plastics today. Okay. Can we at least start better labeling so that the consumers know what they're using, the waste pickers know what they're picking, uh, the recyclers know what they're recycling? You know, we are giving in the waste a set of material that nobody knows what it is. Only I know because I'm a scientist, you know. But then can we not arrive at a, a more transparent labeling system for plastics, you know. And by the way, why this should be global? Why can't India do this on its own, okay? Why this should be global? We should do it, in my opinion, in this country. We should agree upon, uh, today we have the seven-digit labeling. It is outmoded. It is it is completely obsolete. This one to seven, okay. Today we have in 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 the in in our in the stream that we are con we are today consuming. We have at least fifty of them, or maybe seventy of them. Now, how do we then label them? You know, I mean, and I think that should be done in my opinion because that will make the life so simple of uh, of uh, of the so called the downstream. Uh, users, you know, and today we have digital labeling, we have barcode, we have QR code, which all can be read on a mobile phone. So I don't need, you know, uh, just a digit like one. Okay, I can actually embed information on a plastics that I can read through a mobile phone. Okay, I know exactly what it contains. Now, what should be the content of that? That's I think the industry and the and the and the government and the uh, public citizens was sit together and agree upon. But then once we agree upon, we can, that today we have a nutrition uh, label on all foods. You know, why can't we have a good labeling on plastics? You know, and that makes life more simple and also the consumers more selective in terms of what they, what they use. Okay. And I think that is very important. And I think we should do this. This is a scientific thing. And I've been advocating this, but unfortunately I'm not getting any traction on this. Lastly, I think most importantly, I've just concluded in a few minutes, the decision on the future of the plastics in our planet must be strongly underpinned by scientific knowledge. It is not simply a government legislation. Okay, the government can legislate only it has it has adequate scientific knowledge. And I have a feeling that you know we are not using enough evidence-based science in coming to some of the decisions where we are currently taking. Uh, I wonder whether there is an equivalent of a IPCC for plastics. Where is this group of scientists, engineers, social scientists sitting together debating the scientific part of it? Okay, and that should become the basis for an intergovernmental panel to kind of you know arrive at some kind of a decision. But where is there a scientific committee? I do not know. Uh, if the scientific committee is there, who are the members of the scientific committee drawn from around the world? I think they should be, and they have to put in public domain documentation that tells us what is the what is the you know reality today. And I think that is something that I see missing today. And I hope that we have such a body to study, to collect information, to collate and interpret for the for the sake of the government and the public citizens to take decisions. And I hope that that will help us in a more scientific way to mitigate some of the risks that we see of this plastics in our environment. Plastics have made a modern world. They are staple of daily life. From construction to clothing to medicine, technology, transport, you take everything, aircraft, everything, the ships, uh, the mobility, the electric vehicles that you are going to be driving in the next 20, 30 years, the windmills, the solar power, everything requires plastics. Okay. 
everywhere plastics are used. The question basically is, these are extraordinarily useful materials of the 20th century that we have today. But it is, we can see that it is a serious source of planetary distress today. But we must recognize the indisputable fact. Plastics are here to stay. We have to learn to live with it. They cannot, they can be replaced, but only by a small fraction of applications, by other materials. And therefore, we need to learn to live with it, in my opinion. And we can learn to live with it because we have enough scientific data and knowledge and we have enough research that's going on even today as we speak to understand more and more of how to handle these complex materials. And I hope that we bring that kind of a knowledge driven evidence to this problem and see where we can solve them. And of course, it will require social engineering, it will require policy initiatives, it will require public citizens participation, the citizen science, we call it. And I hope all of that will be required. But I think unless we bring all these things into our thinking process, I doubt whether we will come to a lasting solution. So we should not look at it as an isolated single point of solution. It's a very complex problem. It's all, all of them are interrelated to a large extent. And I hope that we can, and we can, my way of looking at solving problem is not to solve a complex problem all in one step. Let's pull out, pull out small, small things that we can resolve. Okay, we agree upon. Let's not agree upon the big things because we, on the big things we'll never agree upon. But let's agree upon little, little smaller things and hopefully make a progress by one little step at a time. But maybe if we do that in the next 30, 40 years, we will solve this problem. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Sivaram. Uh, you have definitely brought in very, very different perspective in many counts. Uh, I mean, whether the issue of a global plastic treaty can be addressed by just a scientific community or we need involvement of other stakeholders is, is a different debate. But uh, let's continue this debate. Uh, so let me just bring in the next panelist. Uh, let me uh, share my screen to uh, introduce my colleague and good friend, uh, Lubna and Anand Krishnan. Um, so, uh, Lubna Anand Krishnan is currently working as a project manager in Kagaj Karch Patra Kashtakari Panchayat, which basically is the genesis of uh, the way how we see this entire movement culminating into a cooperative called Swach Pune. Uh, so, Lubna uh, is a project manager with Swach currently, and she has been part of a large chunk of the journey with KKPKP in Pune, where she handles waste, livelihoods, and recycling related projects. She holds a master's in international economics degree from the John Hopkins University School of Advanced International Studies, Washington, D.C., U.S. Uh, this uh, profile speaks not even 10 percent of the person she is and her accomplishment and her journey and her professional capabilities. Uh, but then we try to keep it short. So thank you so much, Lubna, for being a part of this webinar. Now, I'd request you to share your insights with us and also comment on how you see the agenda of moving towards better product design to facilitate recycling of plastic for economic feasibility and reducing the current scale of impacts on environment and human health. You have about 15 minutes. So over to you, Lubna. Yes. Thank you very much for that very kind introduction. Um, firstly, major compliments uh, to the whole team at CSE and Siddharth in particular for putting together this report. I think it's absolutely substantial and a superb way in for people to understand the landscape um, and who is saying what in the plastics treaty. Uh, it's very easy to be kind of stuck in your own silo and focused on your own country, but this is a superb effort and congratulations. Um, and I'm glad to be part of the launch. Um, I tried to cobble together a presentation very, very quickly so that it's not just me speaking. I hope you don't mind. Uh, I also got, uh, if you don't mind, I'll fill in for my uh, colleague Harsha and cover some of the points about just transition and financing uh, as well. And again, my deepest apologies if it's not very um, well structured. But I think these points are super critical. So just to begin with, 
um, impressions from the document itself. Um, if you look at the beginning of the document, you see a lot more uh, reds and oranges in the upstream section, right? And as you get to the midstream and downstream, you have much more openness and willingness uh, from countries. Uh, it's not all green, but it's not all red either. And there's a marked difference. And I'm specifically talking about these sections, product design, uh, reduce, reuse, use of recycled content, alternative plastics, EPR, waste management. So like Sanat said, finally, uh, everyone is most comfortable when thinking about this as a waste management problem, right? And not really a problem of the material itself. Uh, and I'd like to give some insights from the downstream, from waste pickers, from working on recycling, on recovery of plastics from waste, uh, how much of it is a downstream solution and where the limitations are to that downstream solution um, thought process. So on recycling and use of plastic content um, and changing product design to increase recyclability, uh, the biggest issue here uh, when you look at the realities of recycling is that recycled plastic today still exists only as a cheap, low-cost alternative uh, to virgin plastics. Over the past one year, the prices of crude oil have dropped significantly in India and some other parts of the world, uh, and the market for plastics has been severely depressed. Um, the common way that recycled plastic is used is typically only when virgin plastics get expensive, there's a nice big price buffer, and people don't mind a lower quality uh, product because there's such a big saving in price. In most uh, in most recycled products or products that even use recycled content, recycled content is used as a very small percentage because of the reality that um, recycled plastic is not as good as virgin quality plastic, right? So we may say we are happy to increase the use of uh, recycled content and increase uh, the scope of recycling, but there are real limitations um, to really how that recycled plastic can be used. Uh, throughout the chain, you see that the name of the game is cost cutting and that has a direct impact on quality. Within the recycling process, uh, there are a lot of fillers added uh, in an attempt to reduce the cost and heavyweight the material. These fillers further contaminate your material. So when they come back in waste, uh, they're terrible for recycling. So if you want to have a better quality product, you want to remove a fraction uh, of the recycled plastic. So you're limiting the cycles um, uh, in which uh, the number of cycles that a plastic product can be recycled. If you recycle it once, but you add fillers, the next recycler is going to reject it. If the next recycler does not care about quality, uh, he'll add it in. But what you're ending up with is a worse quality granule with even more limited applications and therefore even more limited price. So who is really willing to pay for a lower quality product um, is a really major question in terms of whether recycling and uh, increasing recycled content is kind of the final solution to this plastic problem. We increase collection, we convert it into a waste management and recycling problem. There are serious limitations um, with that. The fact of the matter is that it still remains a material problem. Plastic degrades when it's recycled. It degrades when it's heated. And you need to be able to counter that degradation. And that is typically done by adding in virgin plastics. So either recyclers who are trying to sell a higher quality granule will add it in in the recycling process, or manufacturers will mix virgin uh, granules and recycled granules in order to have a better quality product. Because the fact is, as you heat the plastics in order to recycle them, you're compromising on their quality. And so stretch it as you may, Again, with the addition of virgin plastics, which is in itself a major issue, uh, stretch it as you may, you're still um, quite limited in how much you can stretch it. Uh, the, the more you try to quality control in a market of fillers and additives, the more weight you, you, you lose. So you buy 100 kilos, you do some quality control, and you end up with only 60 or 70 kilos to sell. Um, and you don't find people willing to pay that much for a recycled uh, granule, because the fact of the matter is no matter what quality control you did, you're not competing with the nice, shiny, clean virgin plastic granules. So there are serious limitations to 
uh, how much recycling can be scaled up, where the demand is going to come from, and who is really going to pay uh, for all of this recycled plastic, and what consumers are going to be willing to use lower quality products at a higher price point. Um, some, so this kind of just uh, goes back to what I was saying about what really happens in plastic recycling. PET, which is currently the most highly recycled plastic of the lot, um, is recycled in an open loop manner, which means it's converted into 90 to 95% of PET in India, converted into polyester fiber, which does not have an end of life application, which goes to the landfills. Interact with any waste pickers today, um, interact with city officials managing MRFs, and they will tell you that cloth is the big problem, the next big issue in waste. Um, and a lot of our plastic, a lot of our very well uh, celebrated recycled plastic like PET is actually going towards something that does not have um, an end of life application. Uh, most HDP and PP plastic, like I said, because it degrades, you need to add a lot of virgin plastic to it. Um, which, again, is not really solving the problem that we're going to solve. Um, this is just a little bit about quality control. And the, the more you try to compete on quality in a sector that is squeezed to compete on low costs, um, you get uncompetitive very, very quickly. You lose, you can see here, about 30% of the waste, 30% um, of the weight of your plastic just to do some quality control, and you will be at a loss to find a recycler who's actually willing to pay that cost. This is for rigid plastics. Um, for flexible plastics, we all know that MLP is a major issue, um, uh, but plastics are not recycled for a wide variety of reasons. Uh, sizes being too small, either the sachets themselves or when they are torn into little slivers or little corners, uh, they don't get picked up. They're contaminated with food waste or they get contaminated as they are passed through the waste system. Or they just have too much metal. Uh, you see these opaque ones at the corner. They just have too much metal uh, to, to be recycled in a plastic recycling machine. Um, you have these new alternatives like the non-plastic substitutes, compostable plastics, or alternatives that look exactly like plastics, but without a separate channel and without them reaching that scale, what you really end up with is uh, those non-plastics going into the plastic chain. Um, and what you expect to go into an industrial composter is just going into an extruder along with your LDP and getting um, recycled into an even worse quality uh, granule. So there's several um, insights on product design from handling material uh, that we can have. If you look at any bottle, you usually have three separate polymers. You have the bottle itself, say, let's take a pet bottle. Uh, its cap is usually either HDP or PP. The ring around it is usually HDP or PP. And the sticker with the brand name is BOPP or a PVC sheet or something like that. Um, which means you already have three different types of plastic. You can uh, streamline design to have, so there are ways to improve uh, your performance. You, if you look at a parachute bottle, I'm not sure if the audience is completely Indian, um, but if you look at something like a parachute bottle, uh, its cap and the entire bottle is made of a single material. Everything is printed onto it directly uh, and colors that work with the blue of the bottle in the recycling process. And so it's a bottle that has very little uh, limitation in terms of uh, physical sorting losses. The big problem with that bottle, though, is what comes inside it, which is oil, which causes a lot of slippage in the recycling process and has many limitations in terms of uh, how it can, how oil containing packaging can actually be recycled. So there are several ways in which plastic products can be marginally improved. A lot of that insight can actually come from the informal sector that's handling it, uh, that's dealing with the different kinds of rejection and can advise on design changes. Uh, but really, the fact of the matter is plastic itself is going to degrade a little bit every time. Um, and it's an expensive prospect to keep extending that life. Um, and really, how far can you stretch recycling? Um, bringing me to the costs of recycling and the myths of wealth from waste. Like I said, recycling is competing in an informal market 
most of the informal sector, uh, most of the recycling in our country, in India, is done informally by the informal sector. And it's done for a good reason. Uh, there are labor compliances, taxation implications, and environmental compliances that are extremely expensive to bear. Uh, and what ends up happening is these costs are either internalized by the workers uh, at the facilities or they are externalized in the environment. Um, the formal players in the system usually either do not end up bearing the full cost, typically have the socioeconomic capital either to get subsidies from the municipalities, like getting public land, or like getting sheds and machinery installed by the city to support a big flashy new project, uh, or they get, uh, they're able to raise venture capitalist funding or charitable funding or impact investment, something that the recycler in the picture that you see is not going to be able to raise for himself. Um, what I have seen over the past few years, as there's been more interest in recycling, there are a lot more people getting into the space laterally, people with finance backgrounds, uh, getting in, seeing this as a booming, as a growing sector, and then realizing why the sector is informal, needing to raise money to make their businesses viable, and typically working on just a fraction of the material. Uh, if you look at most of the formal recycling taking place in India today, and actually across the world, really, uh, most of what even plastic producers are supporting in terms of recycling initiatives is limited to the cream of the cream. You will find people investing in pet recycling, uh, which is really not a problem and already, at least in India, has a very high level. of uh, So it's solving really a problem that doesn't exist. Um, or it looks at very thin slivers of other rigid plastics like FMCG branded HDP products, that kind of thing. Um, and so what you end up seeing is that waste is taken away from the informal sector that was handling it, uh, that was forced to handle it informally because the costs of recycling are so high uh, that the waste is lost by the informal sector. It moves to a new startup or a new formal recycler or even to the city's waste management system. Um, and finally, that system itself is unviable. It needs constant external support. And most often, what ends up happening is it is taxpayers who pay for that external support. Uh, with the exception of, say, charitable or venture capitalist funding, a lot of the waste channeled to EPR and uh, picked up by producers in India today uh, is coming from or leveraging municipal waste management systems. Waste is carried to a sorting space or to a material recovery center by the city at the city's cost using taxpayer money. Um, and producers usually bear a small bit of the last mile cost of carrying that to a cement plant to burn it. And that's where most of uh, the producer responsibility is really coming in in India today. And that means that producers who are supposed to be paying that full cost um, are A, not paying it, leveraging the system that is already handling that material um, and actually pushing the burden of cost back onto the municipality. And so finally, the real question is in terms of who is financing this whole thing, it's do, you, do we want the producers to be able to push the responsibility back onto the citizens, back onto the cities? Or do we want them to work it into their cost of doing business? Because that is not happening uh, today. We have um, a small recycling unit that we've set up uh, in Pune. And these are some figures from our recycling unit uh, that we're trying to run completely above board um, and with all the compliances in place. Uh, it's early days, and I have scaled this up for a for a more at scale operation, and I've also uh, reduced our inefficiencies in the system. What you see is the cost that we are incurring for a kilo is 110 rupees, but the market rates are somewhere between 50 to 80 rupees for uh, rigid plastics, PP and HDP. I'm happy to share more of this and discuss more of this later. Uh, but really, this is to underscore the point that many costs of recycling today, even for the well-recycled materials, are being internalized somewhere or externalized somewhere along the recycling chain 
either by waste pickers who are delivering the materials at a cost lower than what covers their time and labor, by the scrap dealers and the aggregators who are operating informally at very high health and legal risk uh, in order to handle those materials and compete on those thin margins. Um, and even the, even the informal recyclers who themselves are internalizing and externalizing um, a lot of costs and risks um, in order to compete at the very, very, very low market rates that exist uh, for recycled materials. EPR, I covered some of these points already on EPR. Uh, the fact of the matter is um, EPR support as in viability gap funding may actually re be required for more than just your MLP. It's a well-established uh, and well-agreed upon fact that, uh, say, flexible plastics and MLP perhaps need a viability gap funding in order to recycle, uh, but the rigids get recycled, um, and you should be able to buy those credits for a very small cost. The fact of the matter, like I was saying, from our experience with the recycling unit, which we will continue to document and share, is even rigid plastics, when internalizing all costs, and when beginning from the waste picker, not just looking at that recycling enterprise as a separate standalone business, um, it does not look viable. Even recycling HDPE might need a minimum support price in order to pull it over the line. And this is something that the industry is leaving no room for. The cost of EPR credits is shockingly low, determined by the plastic industry, uh, determined by their willingness to pay and is essentially a race to the bottom. The rest of the costs, like I said, is being borne by the informal recycling sector and by municipal waste systems. Um, and that's really something we should introspect whether we are comfortable with uh, or not going forward. Um, EPR is also solving or in the text of the guidelines seems to be solving a waste collection issue and not really a recycling informality and recovery issue. Uh, the kinds of things it suggests really finally lead to exclusion of the informal sector um, and don't plug the gaps. It frames plastic recycling as a collection problem, despite acknowledging that India recycles more than most countries in the world. Um, and so there's a big dissonance in how EPR is designed and what is it really designed uh, to address the way that it works is if you recycle everything, build in all of the costs, um, and actually have companies, plastic producers, bearing that full cost, it doesn't cost 80 paise to recycle MLP. It doesn't cost 50 paise to recycle MLP. That's not the fact of the matter. The fact of the matter is it, is it will probably cost you somewhere between 18 to 25 rupees in order to pick up and send that MLP to a recycler. Um, and unless that is worked into the cost of producing MLP, uh, it's never going to lead to any shifts in design of material or any commitments on the part of the producers because their license to produce is always going to be extremely cheap and not going to cause a dent. Um, so EPR, while has the potential to, to create that upstream pressure. The way it's designed and more importantly, the way it's implemented today is not doing uh, what it should be doing. Um, if final note, though I've covered it a bit uh, about just transition and who should really be playing, uh, paying for the plastics problem. Waste pickers and the informal sector have been recycling, have been responsible for recycling for decades. It's something that our government and everyone in the recycling industry and everyone in the plastic producing industry is happy to acknowledge uh, that India recycles very highly more than many European countries. Um, and it has a live thriving economy supporting millions of livelihoods. Um, but the fact of the matter is that the solutions don't consider the informal sector. Uh, most of what EPR is likely to do is encourage privatization of waste. This is because of a combination of several myths uh, and several uh, kind of gaps in socioeconomic capital. So there is this myth of wealth from waste that startups have the answer to the waste management problem. Uh, that's simply not true. 
um, plastic waste is 30-35% of dry waste and only 8% of municipal waste. Um, and looking at just plastic or just pet um, as a viable and wealth from waste kind of uh, option may be true technically. But if you're really looking at waste, waste is net speaking a loss-making proposition. 75% of household waste is organic waste. And uh, just with that logic alone, uh, you the net... Uh, resource of waste is not profit making. Um, what ends up happening is because of the perceived uh, boom in the sector, you have a lot of government interest, a lot of producer interest, and a lot of startup business kind of interest uh, over waste, but only for the recyclables. This means municipal waste streams are designed to provide waste either to large contractors or to corporates directly or to set systems for corporates. Um, or EPR is set up through private systems that fragment the waste ecosystem and take out all of the recyclables. The current solutions uh, are really siphoning out the cream of the material that are actually the bread and butter of this entire uh, recycling pyramid. Most recycling, like I said, is being pushed and promoted for pet. Um, it's just taking away. So people set up these pet collection centers or these pet bottle ATMs. Uh, most of the solutions like your metal bottles are replacing pet plastic uh, and not re replacing your chips packet, which is really actually a much bigger problem. But the easy solutions are only happening for the less problematic plastics from the waste pickers point of view. What ends up happening because of that is the basket of waste available to waste pickers today is going to reduce. And if you look at where waste pickers incomes are coming from, 50% of their incomes today are coming from plastics. And so as we siphon out the plastics they can handle, their ability to work in recycling, to work in their sector is, is going to get cut at the knees. Um, and we are really pulling away livelihoods from the entire uh, informal sector. It's a similar story with reuse and refill solutions, which are replacing plastic boxes and plastic bottles and really not targeting flexible plastics or multi-layered plastics, which are the real waste collection and handling uh, problem. Unfortunately, in all of this, displacement costs are not factored in. Greenwashing is very, very common. And scale is never really a consideration. You have big systems that displace a few thousand waste pickers and then employ a few tens of waste pickers. Um, and that's never seen because of how informal the sector was to begin with. So, sorry if I was a little all over the place, but in conclusion, um, the costs of recycling today are high. A lot of them simply are hidden and not borne, borne by informal sector and borne by cities. The idea that plastic recycling is a viable business that can be scaled up to solve the plastic problem is a bubble that is going to break soon. And the informal sector is in a position to share data, information, years of experience in why it's been informal um, and where the limitations of recycling really are. The system set in the interim, if they do not protect the informal sector, are going to end up displacing millions of livelihoods um, in India and in other countries where these kind of systems are set up um, and fail to solve the problem uh, in the first place. So with that very bleak summation, I'll add it back to Martin. Thank you. Thank you so much, Lubna. Um, uh, it was just not insightful, but a lot more than that. I mean, you have raised many, many part pertinent questions. Uh, which I hope will eventually reach the floor of the negotiation and be addressed by uh, nations, including India. And of course, we as observers, within our limitations, at, at least we can highlight these agendas whenever we get an opportunity. So we have already exhausted the time that we had. In fact, we have exceeded about five minutes already. But with kind permission from both the panelists, I would like to, I mean, there are not too, too many questions. Uh, I'd like to extend it by another 10 minutes, if that's okay. Uh, Siram, sir. Uh, Lubna? Yeah, okay. I'm yeah. here. Great. So I'll now hand it over to my colleague, Trivuvan, who has also played a very critical role in making this report a possibility. And I would request Trivuvan to take questions and I'd also request Siddharth to chip in and uh, answer as many questions as possible without overshooting the time any further. 
और तो यूट्यूब So it has been a wonderful session covering the global stance on plastic, the scientific angle of the plastic, and some on-ground solutions and issues to the plastic. So I thank the panelist for such an insightful session. So we have some questions. So my first question uh, will be to Dr. Sivarama. Uh, like the plastics are essentially carbon plus chemical bonds to the polymer matrix. So how do we retain the carbon while addressing these chemicals? Over to you, sir. Now you are talking about the additives. Yes, sir. Okay, you are talking about the additives. Okay. Now there are now techniques by which I can separate the additives from the plastics. Okay, and uh, there are emerging technologies, and I think uh, you can actually separate the additives from the plastics. And why? In fact, uh, you even for recycling, you have to separate the additives from the plastics. Otherwise, you don't get. You know, good recycling material. So you need to separate the additives because additives are the biggest problems in the plastics. Now there are three things that we need to do, uh, and one, two of them have to be done by the industry, and one, of course, has to be done, you know, by the society. And I think uh, the industry has to rationalize the use of additives. You now it can be done, and I think that this is one of the things that. Uh, I've been advocating that we probably don't need so much of additives in some of the plastics, or we can do away with them. And this is something that we can, you know, we can voluntarily agree case by case to reduce, uh, because this has been a, a kind of a historical, uh, you know, a practice. And I think we can relook at this practice afresh and reduce these additives as much as possible. The second is a technology by which I can separate the additives from the plastics. Now, this again is a technology that is possible, is available. In fact, there are three pilots are running around the world today. Uh, in the case of polypropylene, which is one of the very additivized polymer, we can recover polypropylene free of the additives. And of course, what you additives are a very small portion of it is less than 0.5% of the weight of the plastic is the additive. So that 0.5% can be separated. You can get a polypropylene, which actually is ideal for recycling, you know, because it's free of additives. And you can, you know, if you want to, you can re-additivate them again. Uh, but this is one, one loop which we have to introduce, you know, that is taking the post-consumer plastic, uh, you know, and, and again, the problem of additives is not there in every case. For example, high density polyethylene uses insignificant amount of additives because it's a pretty stable material. Polypropylene uses a little bit more additives. Now, PVC uses a very large amount of additives. Now, you know, so I think again, you will have to granularize the problem and handle each polymer in a different manner. That's all I can say. And again, in PVC too, we can remove the additives. Now, there is a cost to all these things. And my own feeling is, this is why I said there has this has to be coupled with a public policy. The public policy has to be something in which you have you must incentivize the use of technology, you know, in order to improve. Exactly today, we are in the same position. If you do not incentivize carbon capture technology, nobody is going to capture carbon dioxide. Okay, so that's where the whole host of you know, the, the public policy initiatives are coming. The same way in the plastics industry, again, we have to incentivize and disincentivize practices. And that's only possible through public policy. Because there are technological options, but then there's a capital cost required to, you know, put in the technology. There is a, you know, you need scale to scale the technology. Now, that requires, uh, you know, fresh capital, you know, and then the question comes, you know, how do you finance those? Uh, new initiatives you know this is this is a problem everywhere it's a problem in the case of you know right now we are talking about in the case of carbon dioxide is the same problem and i think here too it's the same problem but i think we can do that i mean that there are scientific solutions available and some of them are now proven for example polypropylene there is a plant which is operating somewhere in you know near columbus ohio which is, is a is a demo plant is about 50, you know 25000 tons of polypropylene is being cleaned from the additives you know Right. So, uh, thank you, sir, for the answer. So, my next question uh, is to Lubna. So, do you think that a harmonized EPR for plastic involving the informal sector and holding the plastic producers or manufacturer accountable can be a solution to the plastic problem? Over to you. Thanks. So, 
um, unfortunately, it's going to come down to the way that it's implemented. Um, in theory, I'm not as cynical about uh, EPR itself, uh, just because unlike a plastic credit kind of solution, this is actually measuring the weight of what you've done. It's not, um, it's not like an emissions reduction kind of calculation, but this can very quickly be converted into a cheap and easy license to pollute, a uh, license to produce, call it whatever you want, uh, which is in reality today how it is being implemented. Uh, the costs of the credits do not reflect anything except the bidding power of the industry right now. They don't reflect any real fraction of the costs of what recycling that and what formally recycling that material uh, really entails. I think that along with changes to EPR, not just in terms of the guidelines and the frameworks, but also in terms of the mode of implementation, whether that means minimum support prices for various materials. See, that also brings in its own fair share of complications. If you just think very broadly, uh, the mountainous regions are going to have much higher logistics costs for the same materials, uh, simply because of the transport distances. And so even minimum support prices are quite limited and may again have a geographical impact in the country that waste in the mountains is never solved and only waste in the big urban centers is solved. Um, so... The only um, hope really is that the costs of the credits reflect all of the gaps in the system and are so expensive that um, paying that additional 20 rupees becomes a cost of production that the companies choose not to bear, that the companies choose to therefore design themselves out of. Um, though, really speaking, I don't know how realistic that is, given the way that the INCs are going, given the way that... Uh, the industry has a hold of this sector and this negotiation. Um, it's difficult to imagine that it uh, really comes and kind of bears all the costs. The other thing is it's not just up to the uh, MOEF, the ministry that's regulating the EPR credits. Uh, informality is a larger problem, like I said, that extends to environmental compliance, that extends to taxation, that extends to labor compliances uh, and all of these other sectors. And without a coherent strategy to actually support formalizing, uh, everyone in the industry is going to push themselves into cost-cutting informal operations in order to be able to compete at the level that the industry is willing to pay for. You know, So unless there's a little more cohesion in all of our regulatory frameworks to actually support more recycling, um, it's probably going to be uh, controlled very heavily uh, by the most powerful in the room. And I don't see the power shifting very soon. Right, right. Uh, so thank you, Lubna, for your answer. And thank you, all the panelists, uh, for your for a wonderful session. Now I'll hand over to Atin, our program director, for the concluding remarks. Over to you, Atin. Yeah, yeah. thank you, uh, I wish we had more time with this amazing panelist to you know ask more questions and have give them more time to you know talk about issues. Uh, in much more detail. Uh, I mean, it has been a fascinating discussion by far. Uh, so the report is released. Uh, we uh, we have also written an article which Siddharth has spoke, spoken about based on the experience of uh, petrochemical industry and what's happening in the nearby human settlements in terms of health impact and other issues. So thank you all. Thank you so much. Thanks to all the international colleagues. Uh, despite belonging to different time zones, you all have uh, registered in large number and attended the event. I happen to know many of you personally. So uh, the event begins, the INC4 begins in Ottawa, Canada in a week time, uh, precisely on the 23rd of April. So Siddharth and I are going to attend it on behalf of CSE. We shall be covering the entire event on a day-to-day -day basis and we shall be writing about it, what's emerging, what's developing, and uh, also we'll try to come back and organize a, a webinar to talk about what emerged from INC4 and how does the uh, revised zero draft is looking like after INC4, after all the, uh, I mean, additions and alterations and negotiations and the complex geopolitics. So thank you all so very much. Thank you, Dr. Sevaram. I know that you had to reschedule many of, many of your prior commitments, but- Thank you very much. It was, yeah. was amazing. I enjoyed, I enjoyed the afternoon. Yeah, thank you very much.
thank you lubna uh, i know harshad couldn't made it but you you did cover the questions that we had for him thanks to tribhuvan minakshi and siddharth for pulling off a herculean task i was honestly not sure that the report will be finished uh, any time sooner but we finished the report we could even print it and at least the pdf copy the soft copies have been uploaded in the site so credit to credit to the team so i would request siddharth to just say a few word and then we are done no i no, i just want to thank uh, uh, dr sivaram and lubna uh, we reached out to both of them at the last minute uh, thank you so much for graciously agreeing to be a part of this and i think uh, today's discussion uh, definitely brings in uh, a lot more perspective from both the sides of the spectrum um, and we really think that you know uh, considering different perspectives is very important while we trying to find a solution uh, to uh, to this crisis so that's it from my side uh, thank you so much for your time today thank you bye Thank you. Congratulations on a superb report again. Thank you. you.